Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's talk in our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. My co-organizers and I are very pleased to have with us today's speaker, Professor Owen Petchy. Owen is a full professor in the Department of Evolutionary Biology and Environmental Studies at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He obtained his PhD from Imperial College in London, after which he did a postdoc at Rutgers University in New Jersey before returning to the UK on a NERC fellowship held at the University of Sheffield. He then stayed in Sheffield uh, as a Royal Society University Research Fellow before he moved to Zurich almost a decade ago. Owen's primary research interest is predictive ecology, uh, for example, how populations and ecosystems change as a consequence of environmental change and predicting extinctions. To work towards improving predictive science, Owen and his group use experimental manipulations in the lab and in, field, in the field uh, combined with modeling. Today, Owen will tell us why ecologists should avoid putting things into groups. As usual, after the talk, there'll be a Q&A session with Owen. Uh, please post your questions in the Slack channel and upvote questions you would like to hear answered. Uh, so without any further delay, Owen, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, thank you to all of the organizers for this uh, very in innovative uh, seminar series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present. And thank you to everyone who is listening, uh, wherever you are and whenever you are. It's Friday afternoon here. Um, uh, so yes, thank you. So why ecologists should avoid putting things into groups? Uh, well, first, I might mention that I'm the, for the pointer is this, um, let's see if this pointer works. There's the pointer I'm going to use it during this talk. Okay, so why ecologists should avoid putting things into groups um, is the subject of this talk. Um, here is um, The Starry Night um, by Vincent van Gogh, a beautiful painting. Um, its original size is about 921 millimetres wide and 737 millimetres high, so nearly a metre squared. And the version that I've got in my presentation is uh, 1,364 pixels wide and 1,080 pixels top to bottom, which means that if this was in its original size, then each of those pixels would be uh, about 0.7 millimeters square. And the version that I've got in the presentation has over 10,000 colors. Now, you can imagine that actually what we're looking at here is, is a landscape covered in species. Perhaps this is a, an image that's been remotely sensed of a, of a landscape. And what we're actually looking at is um, um, the, the, the colours represent the different species uh, or the different individuals even. And what, what I think we do often as ecologists um, and I would encourage you, that those of you who think mostly in terms of evolutionary processes, to think, of, think along with the presentation about how the things that I'm talking about might um, be issues in evolutionary biology also. Um, but as ecologists, I think one of the things that we often do is put on a pair of glasses and, and then gradually group things, um, that is classify things. And I'm just skipping forward through slides, and you might see the image start to change. And you might wonder what I have done to the image um, here. Um, the answer is, I'll just go back a little bit and then go forward again. That's going backwards, this is going forwards through the slides. What I've done is that I have grouped similar colors together into one color. Right? Like I've reduced the number of colors. I haven't done anything to the pixel size, though it might look like I have uh, because there are fewer colors. And so I actually think, so this is something that I think ecologists do quite a lot is take variation and put it into groups. And those groups then do not represent anymore the, the more continuous variation that actually really occurs. Um, just as a side note, I think that actually in, in general life, 
that we may wear these kinds of glasses uh, quite a lot, where actually the variation that we expect that, that, that is out there is very continuous, but actually what we see are categories of things and, and groups of things. So we probably do this as humans quite a lot, um, as, well as, uh, as well as we do when we're ecologists. So what I'm going to talk about um, uh, during the talk are three examples of my research um, and the research with collaborators that looks at how either changing the, the type of glasses that we're wearing changes the, the type of understanding that we can have or, or whether we can actually take the glasses off sometimes and um, if that changes our understanding of course it does. So three examples of that and um, the first example is uh, from research I've done on food web structure um, foraging theory and body size. And this is research done in collaboration with Andrew Beckerman, Phil and Phil Warren at the University of Sheffield, and Jens Strida, Ulrich Broser, and Bjorn Roll, who at the time were at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Um, why study food webs? Why were we interested in food webs at all? Um, this network of interactions, typically feeding interactions among, among organisms. Well, the, the structure of food webs, the complexity of food webs is very important in determining their stability. The structure of the interactions among the organisms has um, implications for the effects of environmental change, and particularly indirect interactions where a particular kind of pathway of effects can cause um, environmental change potentially to have quite unexpected and surprising results when one has an interaction uh, network of interactions and also um, what is the resistance and resilience of this food web to extinctions and invasions for example um, in order to be able to address those issues we need to know the structure of the food web um, and, and also to be able to explain that structure, what are the rules, what are the kind of processes that determine where the links are and how many there are uh, is important. And, and we need an understanding in order to be able to predict their structure as well. So uh, we've done, a lot of people have done a lot of work on trying to understand and predict the structure of food webs. And um, well, what was, what was the problem with a lot of that research or some of that research? Uh, and two of the issues were that the models that were being used were quite phenomenological, did not contain a lot of uh, mechanism, that is to say. And also those models uh, often required that we know the structure of a food web in order to predict it, which, um, well, is obviously a, a little... Um, problematic or not, not as good as we would like. So for example, um, the cascade model of Joel Cohen and, and derivatives of it needed to know two things in order to predict the structure. One of those things um, was, is the number of species and the other thing is the number of links, the number of links in the food web. So in order to predict the structure of food web, we had to know how many links were in the food web. Um, and Knowing and how do we get the number of links in a food web? Well, we may have to observe the whole food web. Uh, so what, what we did, um, particularly Andrew and Phil and I, were, um, well, we first made a more mechanistic model of a uh, food web, and then we used that to predict the connectance, that is the number of links in the food web, predict and predict the arrangement of the links in the food web. And then we moved on to predict the effects of temperature change on the number of links. But the two things that I'm going to focus on now are, well, I'm going to explain the model a little bit and then talk about um, the prediction of the arrangement of links. So I'm not going to talk much about the prediction of, the prediction of connectance, although that was one of the uh, things that we, we felt was most important that we did. So how does this model work? Um, we call it the Allometric Diet Breadth Model, ADBM, and you'll see that ADBM in some of the subsequent slides. Well, the model, the model is, um, uh, the core of the model is, is foraging theory, um, foraging theory that goes back to the 60s, and particularly the contingency model uh, of diet choice. Um, and that's what uh, is in the middle now with the foraging theory. 
And that model says, what it, what it does is it says, well, when a consumer, when a predator has a range of different prey items that it, that it can choose among, and the model predicts which of those prey items it will consume and which of those prey types it will not consume. And to make those predictions, it uses um, four pieces of information, uh, the handling time, the attack rate, the resource density, and uh, the density of each of those types of resources, and the energetic content of each of those types of resources. Um, and then it determines the diet based on which set of resource types maximizes the rate of energy intake. So just to go through each of these, handling time, that's defined as the amount of time it takes me to um, or pick up uh, a food item, eat it, and then digest it. Uh, basically, it's, it's basically everything between stopping searching for prey and starting searching again. Um, attack rate, uh, the second one here, there's another, another term for that is called space clearance rate. And I actually think it's probably a better term because the units of attack rate are either meters squared per second or meters cubed per second. So it's actually the, the rate at which a predator searches through space and potentially clears that space of prey items. Um, the next one down is resource density. So that's number of individuals per, uh, per area or volume. And if we multiply together the attack rate and the resource density, then we get the encounter rate, which would be number of individuals per second. So the number of individual prey items that are encountered per second. And then the energy value of the each of the resource types is the number of joules. And so um, we, given all of those things, we can predict uh, the diet breadth and then the connections to the food web. Um, but to predict the structure and the arrangement of links, uh, we need something else. Um, and one, one, well, two things actually, um, and that's the predator's body mass, so predator size and prey size. And then if we link those allometrically to the handling time, attack rate, resource density, and energy value of the resources, then we can actually predict the arrangement of links in the food web. And essentially what happens is when we have these allometries and the predator mass and the prey mass, we feed the predator mass and the prey mass into the model, create the handling time attack rate, resource density and energy value of each of the combinations of predator and prey, then use the foraging theory to predict whether a link is going to occur or not, and that gives us the, the food web. Um, so, um, when we do that, um, the kind of data that we fit the model to is, is this. Um, here are, are, are the data for four separate food webs, Benguela Pelagic, Coachella Valley, Sierra Lakes, and Tuesday Lake. I want to um, help you uh, understand how to read these. I, mean, I call them predation matrices, and these are the real predation matrices. And what we have here is um, a matrix where the consumers or the predators are in the columns. So each column here is a, is a different predator, um, predator taxa. So here's the, here's the first one. And this, is the first, this one here is the smallest, and then the next largest, and the next largest, and so on, all the way up along here to the very largest predator species. So predators are in the columns. And starting here and going down, the, uh, the prey items, the prey, prey taxa, starting with the smallest, going to the next largest, next largest, and so on and so on and so on, down to the, to the largest uh, prey. And because this is a food web matrix, it's actually the same, the same species, same taxa in the columns and in the rows. So if there is a dot on the diagonal here, what does it mean? Think about this, what does a dot on the diagonal mean? It's the same, it's, it's species, here it's species two eating species two. So it's actually, uh, uh, well, cannibalism. That's what the points on the diagonal mean. Um, and then you can think, well, what do points in this region mean? What do links 
in this region mean? Have a think about that. And what do links in this region mean above the diagonal? This is, so for example, we could look here, this, this, this consumer, this predator is quite large and here it's eating something that's quite small. So links in this region are organisms eating things that are smaller than themselves. And links in this region here are organisms eating, predators eating uh, prey that are larger than themselves. Um, I could ask you another question, that's which of these predators has the uh, broadest diet? Which of it eats the greatest number of prey species? Have a look at the different columns there and see which of them you think is the predator that eats the greatest number of prey species. And of course it is uh, this one, this column, it's got the greatest number of dots in it. So actually the diet breadth of a predator is the number of links in a column. So that's how to interpret these predation matrices. And um, when, the small, when the dots are smaller, like in this case, it's because there's more species. And so we just made the dots smaller so you can see. And um, you can see that there's some structure in these predation matrices. And what we do is we, we fit the model to these by selecting uh, allometric exponents that give us the greatest overlap between predicted links and observed links. And this is the result. Um, it's a version of the model called the ratio ADBM ratio because it's the ratio type of relationship between uh, predator and prey mass in determining handling time. And this prop correct is the proportion of correct links. And basically it's the number of black dots here, which are the predicted links that overlap with observed black dots. So it's 57% here uh, for this. And um, the colours that are behind here are the profitability of each of the prey for the particular predator. And so you can see there's quite high profitability where it's red going down here. And then the profitability drops off as the prey decrease in size in this particular case. And so we get 57%, 65%, 60%, 46%. And I will let you decide whether you think that's a high proportion, you know, the model's doing well or not. And actually, uh, it's, it's not such an easy um, uh, question to answer. Um, you can look at that in another way. Uh, each of the axes here is for a different version of the model. The x-axis is the power um, function we use for determining handling time from predator and prey size. The y-axis is what you've already seen, the ratio. And on here is just the proportion. So, so when we look at a, a food web, a food web that's up here, it's like the model's doing really quite well at predicting the structure. There's a lot of overlap, 60% or so in the link, predicted links and observed links, whereas down here the model's doing an awful job. Um, less than 10%. Basically, this is because these food webs are not size structured, and these food webs are size structured. The one I want you to focus on here is this one, Broadstone Stream. And uh, this is a food web that Guy Woodward put together during his PhD. Um, and loads and loads of the research that Guy did on the organisms in this food web, invertebrates, um, caddisfly larva, dragonfly larva, and such like, um, indicated that the interactions here, the trophic interactions here are highly size structured. So, so size is a very, very important determinant of whether a species eats another one in this, in the, in the, among these organisms. And yet we get kind of mediocre in uh, performance of the model, but we would expect the model to do very, very well when the actual observations themselves were very size structured. So what's going on here? Why isn't the model doing a better job um, of predicting a structure of this food web? I'm going to show you a bit more detail about this particular case. The matrix here is uh, arranged exactly the same as before. Predators along the columns from smallest to largest. The names of them are down here. And then resources from smallest to largest. And so we can see the diet of this particular species going down here. 
Now, the black dots, as before, are the observed links. The observed, so we observed this species feeding on this species. Right, Guy did. Guy observed it, not me. Um, and the gray, uh, gray circles are, are where we made a prediction. So, so when there's an overlap of those two, like here, it's the, the correctly predicted link. You can see here, so now we're wearing these, these glasses, which take, this, uh, take the individuals and, and group them into species. And when we do that, the model gives us, uh, gets 52% gets of the links correct. This is more than 40% we saw, uh, saw previously. And that's because we've helped the model here by telling it which of the species are predators and which of the species are not predators. Um, and that gives it quite a lot of help. It does a much worse job if we don't tell it that. Um, and one of the things, now can you see, I hope it's not blacked out, maybe I'll just move that. Uh, now the bottom may be blacked out. Um, so the, on, on this side here, I show the mean body size of each of the species and the, body, and the range of body size of the individuals in that species. And you can see, and this is, a log 10 axis um, from minus eight to four. So within each of these species, we've got massive variation in, uh, in the body size of individuals. Um, and so what Guy and I thought was like, well, let's, let's see what happens when we group the species, group the individuals, sorry, when we group the individuals into, into size bins. So we ignore taxonomy. Talk, we know, ignore taxonomy completely and put them into size bins. And here is what happens. Oops. Oops. Here is what happens when we do that. Um, we get 83% of the links correctly predicted. Um, and so just changing our glasses from being glasses that put the individuals into species compared to putting the individuals into size bins completely changes our understanding of the system. It's 83% of the links um, predicted correctly and tells us, yeah, this is a size structured food web. It only looked at it like it wasn't because we were ignoring all that intraspecific variation in body size. So uh, I, I grant you that this is not, this, we're still grouping, but we're doing a more appropriate grouping here in this case. Um, we're not uh, the only ones to notice this. There's a lot of research on um, using traits uh, in, in food webs, um, particularly size structure characterizations of marine food webs. So please do take a look at that um, if you're interested. Um, so that's one example of how, uh, at least how changing the grouping to a more appropriate grouping, it's a better representation of the variation that's out there um, can help us understand. That's one example. There it is. The next example of research that I've done is uh, research done with Kevin Gaston, Marcus Ciancieruso, and Marco Batalha. Um, and that is research about the relationship between uh, functional diversity here on the y axis and species richness, which is on the x axis. Now, if the relationship between these two is relatively linear like this, and we say that, that then there is a lack of redundancy. And that is that, in a, in a, when we lose species in this direction, we lose proportional amount of functional redundancy. So species are not redundant with respect to each other. Whereas in this case, with the curved relationship, as we, as we start to lose species, we don't lose much functional diversity. And so there's redundancy there, redundancy hypothesis. And um, uh, this is the, the relationship that we're concerned with. We're concerned with how much redundancy there is in ecological communities. Here's one answer to that. An answer published in 2001 by Fonseca and Gennard. It is an analysis of uh, data uh, a study by uh, Diaz and Cabido, and I'm going to put the reference to that on the next slide. Um, and what this shows is that if we start here with all species present, that is no extinctions having occurred, then there's eight functional groups. 
Now, as species gradually go extinct, as 10 species have gone extinct, 20 species have gone extinct, 30 species have gone extinct, 40, 50, 60, 70 is around here, we can, we can lose 70 species or 70% of the species and still have a pretty good chance that all of the functional groups remain. And so this is evidence of actually really kind of astounding uh, redundancy, functional redundancy in the community. We can lose 70% lose of the species and still have all of the functional diversity remaining. After that, things start to decrease very quickly, but, um, but that's the, the impression that's given by this approach. Um, how does this approach work? Let's look into it in a little bit more detail. Well, the first thing that we need to do is measure functional traits of, of species. Here is the table from that publication by Diaz and Cabido, Plant Functional Types and Ecosystem Function in Relation to Global Change. Um, so one measures the functional traits of each of the species and then um, makes a dendrogram of those, uh, well, actually of similarities among the species. Um, calculate a distance matrix and then do a hierarchical clustering is, is what ha what's happened here. Uh, and then the next step is to use the dendrogram and kind of cut the dendrogram, that's where the red line is, cut the dendrogram, and then species um, that are kind of together in that cut are in the same functional group and species that are kind of separate on that cut are in different functional groups. So for example, here is, uh, here is the dendrogram being cut and all of the species that, that go this way, all, all of these down here from there down to there in the same functional group. Um, this, this species here is in its, it's in its own functional group because uh, it's cut here and here's two species together in a functional group. Now, I don't think I've put the red line in the right place to get eight functional groups, um, but that is what we would want to do if we were going to actually repeat the study. Uh, so that's, that's what we do uh, to divide the species into functional groups uh, in a quantitative way. And then, then we can do simulations and say how many species, or how many functional groups are we likely to have remaining if we lose one species or two species and so on. And this is the result that we get. Um, now, if you are thinking what would happen if we moved the red line, then um, well, here is the answer. The red line goes down to a situation here where there are many, many functional groups, each with just one species. Let's move this. And we get a uh, relationship that's indicating no redundancy. But we can move the line higher and higher. And as we move it higher, there's fewer functional groups and each of them has more species. And as we do this, then we get more redundancy. Is only two functional groups, each with lost species. So we get loads and loads of functional redundancy. Um, and the most important point now is that there is no, as far as I know, there is no objective level at which to draw that line. We, we can kind of, yeah, we just can't say this, this, is, this is the appropriate place to draw the line, for example. There is no way to do that, as far as I know. Um, and so this is like we're wearing a pair of glasses. It's a relatively arbitrary pair of glasses. And, um, and we get a different result if we were going to put on a different pair of glasses. Um, this is like wearing a pair of glasses that... That, that would show the starry night without, with loads and loads of colours. And this is like wearing a pair of glasses that, that shows us the starry night with just two colours. Um, and we don't know which pair of glasses is the right one to wear. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to um, not, wear any, not wear any glasses at all, or at least not to wear the glasses that make functional groups. Take those glasses off and throw them away. Um, and the way that we proposed to, uh, to do this was to use the branch length of the dendrogram as the measure of functional diversity. So for these two species here, Klebau and Eklu, um, 
it's, it's the, le the length of the two blue lines that would be the measure of functional diversity, the amount of functional diversity, and for a different two species that are less functionally similar, then it's the distance of the, it's the sum of these two blue lines. And so these two species are, are, are redundant with each other relative to these two species. Um, and then we can do exactly the same kind of study and see how the the length, the, the length of the dendrogram or the length of the dendrogram that's required to connect up the species changes with the number of species. And this is what we get. Uh, there's the original graph from Fonseca and Gennard. And um, I've switched the axes so it goes in the same direction from all of the species present down to none of the species present. Here's all of the species present down to none of the species present. And when we do this with functional diversity measured with this branch length measure, then even if we if we try and remove the species, if we do remove the species, so that there's the minimum possible loss of functional diversity each step, that's this top line here, then it's still a, it's still a relatively linear uh, relationship. Um, and so when we throw away these glasses and say we're not going to use functional groups, but we're going to actually use all of that or most of that variation that we see in the traits of the species, it fundamentally changes the answer from being um, great redundancy to virtually no redundancy in, in the community. Um, so, um, you know, you might say to yourself now, well, Owen, you're still wearing glasses, actually, and those glasses are species glasses because we're using one trait value for each species, whereas there's intraspecific variation in trait values. Um, and we, we and others have done work on this um, and shown that um, you can, we can work with that with individual uh, level traits. Um, I should say that the only reason why we could do that work with the Broadstone Stream food web, Guy Woodward's food web, is the, is the work that he did during his PhD, which was actually to collect individual um, consumers, dissect them, and look at the guts. And so the reason why we can do this work um, uh, is, is because we've got that individual level data. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what we looked at a little bit in this study. Um, and um, I'd encourage you to have a look at this study if you're interested. There's also um, uh, some very nice uh, recent developments about how to deal with uh, measuring functional diversity when we've got individual, individual level data. It turns out that it's a bit computationally difficult to work with um, many, many individuals um, and uh, some really nice methods. Um, your functional diversity metrics using kernel density n-dimensional hypervolumes, uh, for example. Um, so um, I think that uh, this is, a, again, it's a way to take off those glasses that are aggregating individuals into species and species into functional groups. Uh, so that's the second example of actually, you know, when we take the glasses off, it fundamentally changes the answer from high redundancy to low redundancy. Extremely important. All right, then, well, the third example of my research is, I should, I should not take too long with this, is um, a kind of different kind of aggregation. Now, if you think of this as a map, then the other kind of aggregation that we can do is this. Of spatial aggregation. We, we, put, we, we, we take all of the individuals and we put them into a, a quadrat and characterize that quadrat, that plot, with one number. Uh, that's what's going on here. Spatial aggregation or aggregation into communities. And we might need to do this if we want to do something as simple as compare the diversity among locations. This is an image of um, a ridge. It's a west to east ridge uh, close to Zurich that's um, uh, very, very well studied, particularly by remote sensors. They like to fly airplanes over this and record things. Um, and I got involved in a project where we did that. Um, before I get onto that, um, so. If we're asking this question of whether two places differ in their diversity, is one more and more higher diversity than the other, then we actually need to kind of specify what the, the extent of that location, those two locations are. But in a way, we need to define what the community is. What are the boundaries of the community? And this is about like defining what 
community ecology is. And it requires us, or it has required us, to define the scale of what, what the community is. And this has been um, the, the um, subject of uh, a lot of discussion. Um, here are some of the, the uh, publications about it, disintegration of ecological community, what is a community, is a community still a community, and so on. Um, so it's a very important issue in community ecology in particular. It's like what aggregate, what group actually makes up a community? Um, and so this, the work that I did that got me thinking in a slightly different way about this, um, and I was late to the game actually, is this work with uh, Fabian Schneider, uh, other colleagues at the University of Zurich, and Dave Schimmel at JPL. Um, it's mapping functional diversity from remotely sensed morphological and physiological traits. The upper map here is a, a color of um, the, the morphological trait variation along of the, of the trees along that ridge, and the bottom is the physiological trait variation. And each, uh, and the image is made up of pixels. And so actually the, the, the object of observation, if the unit of observation here is a pixel. And the question is, well, how do we then calculate something like functional diversity? Um, and what we do is we just take a bunch of pixels and calculate the diversity of a bunch of pixels. And here are three different measures of functional diversity. And each of the little dots in each of these graphs is a, is a pixel. So for example, on the left, we can calculate the, uh, the volume of the pixels. And that gives us our measure of uh, functional diversity. And the question is, well, how many pixels should we put in here when we, when we do it? And what uh, Fabian thought was, well, let's not actually make a decision about how many pixels is the right number of pixels. Let's just do lots of different numbers of pixels. Um, and so on the x-axis of these graphs is the radius um, in meters that we're actually including pixels from when we calculate functional diversity. Um, the left-hand case here is uh, for functional richness. And so as we increase the number of pixels, we increase the radius of the community, if you like, then the amount of functional richness increases. Um, I'm not gonna explain much else about the, these graphs. I'd encourage you to have a look at the uh, publication if you'd like to know more about them. Um, but the key point is that we've kind of, we've taken off our glasses of community ecologists here and rather, um, thought about um, the scale dependence of diversity. Uh, another way of thinking about this is, um, or it, for me to illustrate it, is uh, with this simulation that I've done. And on the left, um, pretend we're looking down on a quadrat, and I've randomly, oh, no, sorry, I've distributed some red individuals and some blue individuals. And on the right is the relationship between the distance between any two pair of individuals and whether they're of the same species. That would be the upper points, or whether they're from different species. And, and, the, and the line there um, is just showing the, the scale dependence, that's distance dependence, of the likelihood of the two individuals being from a different species. And this is what might happen for a different plot. We might have a different relationship. And the key thing here is the answer to the question of whether one plot is, is more or less diverse than the other is dependent on the scale at which we actually uh, are choosing to answer that question. Um, and um, I think this is extremely important in community ecology. I'm not the only one. I said I'm kind of coming a bit late to this, perhaps. Um, uh, John Chase has been a pioneer of this uh, embracing scale dependence. I might just read part of this. Um, let's see. Uh, which part? Which I yeah. So we found that the rare refraction curves frequently crossed, implying reversals in the ranking of species richness across spatial scales, which is what I showed on the previous slide. So we get different answers depending on what glasses we're wearing. If we're wearing one glasses for one spatial scale, we get one answer. And glasses for another spatial scale, we, we get another answer. And there's a lot of very well developed methods in ecology. Uh, for these spatially explicit metrics of species diversity, uh, but I don't think they've really pervaded ecology yet. Uh, so that's the third example. Aggregation into communities, we have to choose what scale, and then if we free ourselves of that aggregation into communities, 
where you were not doing community ecology anymore, we're just doing continuous ecology, um, then this scale dependence becomes apparent and we view and perceive much greater and richer amount of variation in the world. So um, that's nearly the end. But why ecologists should avoid putting things into groups. Now, as you've seen, I am always shown that. Sometimes it's different groupings that um, I'm saying are, are better than others. Um, but the three cases, again, um, if we group species, if we group individuals into species, we get relatively poorly predicted, uh, a relatively poorly predicting model. Whereas if we go to size bins for those uh, individuals, and we get a very good prediction of food web structure. If we group species into functional groups, we perceive high functional redundancy. Whereas if we don't do that functional grouping, we perceive low functional redundancy. And then, as I was saying, the, the decision, if, we, if, we, if we're trying to make a decision about what level, at what spatial scale to aggregate communities, then the answer could be very dependent on that. And the solution is to kind of throw away our glasses and say, we're just going to look at all, all of the spatial scales. Or if you like, you could say we're wearing all of the glasses, we're wearing lots of different pairs of glasses at the same time. Um, so that's, uh, that's the three examples. I'm sure there's lots of other examples of um, how we can benefit from not aggregating or at least being very careful about how we aggregate and critical about how we aggregate. And I'd love to hear about other examples of that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, thank you very much to the University of Zurich for um, giving a, um, a fantastic environment uh, to do research. Um, thank you for all the collaborators um, who've uh, helped me with this research, or more than helped me, inspired me with this research. Um, thank you very much for the organizers of this uh, seminar series. Uh, ecology, uh, evolution and Ecology Seminar Series. I'm sorry that it's not had more evolution in it, um, but uh, perhaps that's something we can talk about. Um, particularly, uh, thank you to Andreas Sutter, who helped um, me uh, with this uh, taking place and all of the other organizers of the seminar series. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, and um, I wish you a very good weekend and a nice summer. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Owen. That was very good, thought provoking. Um, as people still get a bit of time to type their questions, I might start off with one myself. Um, so, should I, Andreas, should I stop sharing the presentation and go back to just oh, me? Maybe, um, unless, unless you, you think you're going to flick back onto some slides. You can, you okay. can leave it. It's fine. Um, okay. So, so in a way, is or maybe I'm thinking wrong about this. In a way, is is putting things into different types of groups, like you like you show with the species versus size thing. Science thing can that in a way tell us what what is the actual important groupings or like, to find a grouping that kind of makes sense from a biological point of view? Yeah, I think I think that's what was happening in that particular example. We. Uh, switch between two different groupings and we found the one that was more appropriate for representing the variability in the process and, and, and the importance of that variability for the processes in that situation but actually you know it what i'd really like to do is to remove the groupings completely from that situation and actually the reason why we need the groupings so why we can't why can't we just deal with the individual level data why do we have to aggregate it at all? And that's in the formulation of the model. And mm. so, it's, so that's where the glasses are being worn. It's, it's by the model. We're responsible for the model. But, um, and so I, was, I have thought um, to some extent about how we can reformulate that model to, um, be work at, to work at the individual level. And I think actually it would be a fantastic thing to do, a very interesting thing to do. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we, as you as you said as well. Of course, we're as human beings. We 
we're very much primed to put things into groups. So it's maybe hard to resist that temptation, but you've showed very compelling evidence for, for the dangers of, of doing so. Um, so should, should evolutionary biologists avoid putting things into groups as well? <laughs> um, so I was thinking about that a little bit, and uh, I mean, I'd love to discuss it um, more with evolutionary biologists. Um, one thing I was thinking about, so one, one thing I was, um, one study I uh, was very interested in recently was one that used uh, metageno metagenomics of, uh, of a bacterial community in a lake. I was looking at how the composition of that metagenome changed over time. And they used metagenomic binning, met or genome binning, to take that variation and actually construct uh, species, populations or species um, mm -hmm. by binning together um, constructs that were similar. And um, actually, I'm not sure that's an, well. Well, and, and it's the reason why I bring that up in terms of evolution is because that was a study of whether uh, whether evolution was occurring the first via um, genome-wide selective sweeps or um, uh, or I think um, horizontal gene transfer, so mixing uh, 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 gene-specific sweeps. Um, so they were addressing an evolutionary question and part of the methods to do that involved um, aggregation. I don't know how important that aggregation is in that case. Um, you know, any time that one takes um, variation and puts it into a group, then there's possible problems. So the concept of a genotype, like, are all, I mean, when one says it's a, it, 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 one has a genotype, is ev does every individual have exactly the same genotype? Or is there variation and, and then we ignore some of that variation in order to say, well, that's just a genotype. I don't know. It's probably different in different cases as well. Um, mm -hmm. I suspect I'm not I'm not totally uh, sure about this. Is if some if we found some way of comparing ecology, ecology and evolution, I suspect we would find that uh, evolutionary biology does a bit less grouping. But um, no, it's certainly uh, like community. It's not like community ecology, which at, which at its core needs a community, which is a group. Mm. But I think it's something to to think about uh, more. Yeah, well, it, I think a, a potential analogy could be, you know, when we when we as uh, I myself and others, um, when we think of of alleles, for example, you know, we typically um, or a lot of people, including myself, would would think of those as being, you know, functionally different alleles. But oftentimes, I think it's it's not entirely certain where that function changes. But I guess. That, that is not so dissimilar from from you know function as you as you showed with this changing the levels of of functionality where is where does that threshold take place or, or is, the, is there any any threshold um sorry i'm rambling a bit there but i was wondering if there's a is there an empirical way to get towards the the answer for some of these things like which level i don't know you're saying maybe not use that all but whether whether there is a certain level of of functional diversity that actually matters, so you could um, try and empirically get at where where you get this sort of resilience against against extinction, for example. Um, I'll, I'll do a little bit of interpretation of the question, and you can tell me if I've answered it. But um, so if the, if the question was like what number of functional groups is the most appropriate number of functional groups or if you like what level of um, uh, trait accurate measurement accuracy that we need to go for. Um, uh, one way of answering that is empirically and we can use um, experiments where we manipulate the, the species that are in a community or even the individuals in, in the species that are in a community and record functional properties of that species um, and see which level of aggregation leads to the greatest predictive power for that function. It does require uh, manipulative 
experimentation of species composition, which is um, uh, well a big task. Um, <clears throat> so actually trying to do it on observational data is also very uh, very important, which is where actually you know observational data at large scales, and so that's where um, some of the uh, remote sensors that are working in uh, at the University of Zurich and elsewhere are trying to link with ecologists to say, can we link together um, remotely sensed traits to remotely sensed functioning and then across scales um, try and find out what level of functional grouping is, um, is most predictive. Mm. Okay, we are starting to get some questions in from the audience as well. Um, so one person asked, if I'm understanding correctly, you're advocating for ecology to avoid functional traits. Aren't species another functional grouping? So I'm not advocating avoidance of functional traits. Um, they're, the, they're, the base, they're, they're the basics that we're working with here. Um, what I'm, uh, and, but the second part of the question was, aren't species groupings as well? Is that correct? And yeah, species are, are absolutely uh, groupings as well. And so uh, I, uh, I am very interested in doing ecology without species, <laughs> um, doing ecology with just traits. Um, and that's what we did with the food web uh, study. We just you, we, we we threw away the taxonomy and we only used body size. Um, so I, I find that very interesting. Uh, I love taxonomy as well. I love species as well. Um, but yeah, when we put individuals, when we when we when we have one trait value for a species, and think about how often we have one trait value for a species then we have uh, done a, a grouping. And, and think about how many times we, ha we have one trait value for species and we have researched whether it is important that we've got rid of all of that intraspecific variation. Um, and and I, don't, I really don't want to come across as being critical of the people who've gone and measured traits of individuals and species. That is I couldn't have done any of this without any of that. So we, we would be nowhere without all of those measurements. So it's not a criticism of that at all. It's more of, uh, it's more of a criticism of uh, people like me who then take that data and, uh, and calculate species averages of it. Um, yeah. Um, right, so we have another question. How do you determine what genetic changes to use to study diversity? I'm not sure I understand that. So how does one determine what genetic changes one uses to study a diversity? Um, well, so I'm currently writing a proposal that aims to do just uh, that, I think. Uh, so we're interested in what genetic changes in an organism um, what, what the implications of those genetic changes would be for biodiversity and then what that change in biodiversity would have, what the implications of the change in biodiversity would have for response to environmental change. And uh, the way that we are determining, or I mean it's a hypothesis, the way that we form our, our hypothesis about which genetic differences will will cause an important difference in biodiversity is through through a model um, of, of the system and of the interactions among the organisms so for example if we have a model that says um, it is the um, the tolerance of this organism to salt concentrations in the environment it is a particularly important characteristic for response of the community to, to the environment. Um, and, and then we can see that different organisms have different salt tolerances, so they potentially have crossing lines. Um, and then we have enough information about the uh, 
the genetic and metabolic determinants of salt tolerance, then we can start putting all of that together um, and linking genetic differences to functionally important variation in biodiversity. So there's fantastic studies now out there on that spans those scales, because we're talking about spanning scales now and linking ecology and evolution, which is fantastic work. And I really want to do more of it. Mm. Right. OK, I've got some more questions coming. Um, in your first example, I wonder how your mechanistic model for food web compares to the phenomenolo phenomenological models in terms of their predictive power. A related question is why did your model predict that only large species eat small species, um, but not the other way around? Yeah. So the first question, how does our model compare to the more phenomenological models? Um, well, <clears throat> when we submitted the paper to Nature, um, um, one of the reviewers said, uh, and we had some of those comparisons in the manuscript, comparing phenomenological models to um, more mechanistic model. One of the reviewers said, don't do it. Um, don't make that comparison because um, the models are too different, too different. In, that it's like comparing apples and oranges. You know? And one of the things I wanted to write back was like, well, you can compare apples and oranges. You know? I'm going to eat this, uh, eat this apple, eat this orange. I can, I can say which I think, which I think um, tastes the best. So I don't actually accept that you can't compare apples and oranges, but um, I didn't reply that. Um, um, what did we do? Um, we just took their advice actually and, um, and took that out of the manuscript. It didn't do any good because they still rejected it. Um, but um, then, we, um, then we actually uh, got, got into, a, a quite quite a heated debate about um, whether we should have made that comparison. Uh, someone was arguing that we should have made that comparison. You know, one of the and one of the really different. So we can we can compare the, the accuracy of, of of a very phenomenological model and a very mechanistic model. Um, but one of the things when when one is comparing the predictive or the explanatory performance of models is is one of the things that we really should take into account is uh, complexity of the model, um, like AIC does, for example. Mm. But another thing that we should take into account is what the model is capable of doing, and the mechanistic model we have demonstrated is capable of doing things that the phenomenal phenomenological models so far have not been able to do. For example, predicting the effect of temperature on food web structure. And so once we get into the realm of saying, well, the model, can, the model is so different that it can do things that, like predict the effect of temperature that another model can't do, then how do we, you know, how do we compare them? So I kind of come to the conclusion that we can't compare those. And I've forgotten the second part of the question. Um, it was why, why, how come the model only predicts predation top down, as it were, from body size style? Right. So, and that is because that is what mostly happens in the data. Mm -hmm. Now, you might, you'll say, well, the data do actually con contain some interactions where, a, where a, a small predator was eating a larger one. But um, the way the model works, is it, it wouldn't have been able to predict just that little strip of interactions that went down for one predator. It would have had to have predicted also that the predators relatively similar in size were also eating below the diagonal. Um, so, it's, so it's somewhat to do with the constraints of the model um, coupled with actually what's observed um, in, the, in the food web. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to slightly paraphrase. The, so measurement types and errors must inevitably lead to grouping of quantitative data, right? Because you can only, there's a certain resolution to which you can um, measure things. Do you think that grouping is a problem or that's, that's not really an issue? I think it, I think it, um, it, it can easily be an issue. Um, so, you know, if we have a, if we, if we have a categorical trait, 
which we often do, um, then we should be quite critical and think, is this already um, a categorization of continuous of what is in, in reality continuous variation. So for example, if we're gonna if we classify birds' diets into I don't know, insectivores, frugivores, carnivores, we have we have that group in in the trait matrix, then you know, we've already done the grouping um, in our measurement, if you like. Um, but then one has to think, one should be critical and think, well, where did those categorizations come from? Did they come from observations of a portion of each of those different types of prey that the predator was eating, the bird was eating? And if so, can we use that raw data, that more raw data? Um, I suspect that most of, uh, I suspect that we can often, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here, uh, often measure things with sufficient accuracy with the instrument that we are holding. Um, to capture um, uh, the, the variation, at least, at least the, the, the accuracy of that measurement, in, the precision of that me measurement instrument is uh, greater than the, um, the intraspecific variation among individuals. But I'm sure there are exceptions to that. Some things are very difficult to measure accurately. Some things change through time as well. I mean, that's another, and that's another type of aggregation, uh, temporal aggregation. Where we are actually measuring uh, the trait, we might be measuring the trait value of an individual. That uh, tomorrow it's different, um, and if we want to use in a model, uh, if we want to include that individual in a model, which trait value do we give it? Today's tomorrow's, or do we average the two, or do we formulate the model in a way that can um, actually represent that continuous variation through time? Hmm. Lots of food for thought. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we have to stop um, here and for the sake of time. Um, apologies to people whose questions have not been addressed, Owen. I will email Owen uh, these questions and he'll, he'll try to get back to you and I'll, I'll put them back in the, in the Slack channel. Or Owen might um, write them in the Slack channel directly. Anyways, we'll see. We'll, we'll try to get to you on those questions. Um, so before I go, just a reminder that from next week, we're switching to a Wednesday only schedule for at least the next two months. Uh, next Wednesday, instead of Anna Kornström, who's unfortunately had to cancel, we'll have uh, Rob Nell, who'll be talking about sexual selection, adaptation and extinction. So please do join us again next Wednesday. Uh, you can keep up to date as ever with the schedule on um, by following us on Twitter or uh, checking and following uh, joining our slack channel i guess um so yeah thanks for watching thanks again owen for a great talk and um see you all next week